I've dated some women here and there, but it's just a different ball game with women. And I feel like I'm very behind. I feel like very much like a baby queer. And so I'm also very intimidated by very beautiful women because I'm like, mm. how do I know if she's gay or likes women? Like, How do, do you know? Step? I don't know. I asked Twitter and everyone was like, look at the, the length of her nails. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, but that doesn't mean anything. I have long nails. Does that, does that go for gay guys too then? I cut my no, nails yesterday. No. <laughs> <laughs> really? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, welcome back to Growth Minds. Today we've got the one and only Anna Akana mm -hmm. here today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Uh, so your team kind of briefed me on all the things that you're doing. And I was just like, usually I introduce people by like, okay, she's, or he's like an actor or I couldn't, I couldn't do it. There's like a running list of all the things that you're up to. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's crazy. That's some crazy discipline you must have to be able to, yeah. to be able to do this. Um, and I imagine it comes from the fact that your father was a U.S. Marine. Yes. When he was growing up for, for 20 years or something like that? Yeah, I kind of got the best of both worlds because my childhood was sort of bifurcated by this very stern, strict uh, dad who was all about intelligence and academics and work ethic and discipline. Yeah. And my mom is this free spirit artist who is always trying some different kind of art form or exploring some hobby, learning some new skill. And so I got the perfect education to be in show business because yes. I was like, oh, I know how to access creativity and art and turn my pain into something tangible and beautiful. And I also know how to sit down for a set amount of time every day and actually work on stuff. Which is kind of rare. I mean, I imagine most people have one or the other, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of the people I know are definitely one or the other. <laughs> are you more left brain then or, or right brain? I feel like I can switch between the two pretty, pretty well, like on yeah. command. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And um, you grew up in Asia parts of the time, right? Yeah. You, grew up some I spent you spent like some time. Four years in Okinawa, a couple of years in Korea, a uh, summer in the Philippines. Nice. My yeah. aunt used to live in Okinawa. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. It has the lowest pedophile rate of the whole world. <laughs> Damn. <Yeah. laughs> Is that why you moved back. there? You're like two, you're like researching? Yeah. <laughs> no, they had like a military base there, but it was so safe. You could raise your hand on the freeway and people, yeah. all the cars would stop and let you pass. It was like the safest place to grow up. It Whoa. was so lovely. Japan is super, even now it's still like one of the safest places to live. Yeah. Um, but you spent time in Korea also. I did, What yeah. part of Korea? Uh, we were in Seoul for a bit, mostly because my dad loved uh, StarCraft. So we were all forced to go to the Whoa, I'll be your dad's cafes. best friend. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, he was a WoW addict for years. Oh, my and God. And my mom are big gamers. And so we spent a lot of time in Korea. I think literally just for them to game all the time. Yeah. He, well, he must be really good, though, because he's actually got some strategic background in oh, that yeah. field. And being a military officer, he was like, okay, uh, on World of Warcraft, I'm going to play as a female character and dance for men online so that they give me silver. <laughs> he was very smart about it. <laughs> I mean, I did that too, but, yeah. you know. <laughs> we all did. <laughs> we all did that, yeah. Um, gotcha. And then what? how long? Did, how, how many uh, years did you spend in Korea? I think like two. Yeah. Okay, just two years. Yeah. You didn't really remember no, no, I didn't, much. and I didn't go to like a Korean school. Like in Japan, I actually went to a Japanese school, but for the rest of the time, I've been going to on base and speaking English. Gotcha, gotcha. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where the discipline comes from. I imagine you've got the tiger parents that that came in, um, but I also you dropped out of university or college. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. High five. We don't need you, college. Examples of two of the best representations of Asians here. <laughs> <laughs> I was also late to this uh, interview, so yeah. oh, not a good first impression. Three minutes late. Three minutes fun. late. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what was that like? What was their uh, What was their reaction when they first heard about it? Uh, well, my younger sister committed suicide when she was 13 in 2007, and I was 17 at the time. I was a high school senior, um, and kind of around the time when you're sort of applying for colleges. So my parents sort of understood my decision. I went to a semester in community college to figure out, like, what I wanted to do with my life now because, you know, encountering death that young really forced me to face my mortality and whether or not I actually wanted to go into the Marines like my father, and I didn't. Um, so they were not happy about me pursuing a career in stand-up and, and acting and YouTube and all that stuff. Yeah. But they sort of came around when they saw me perform for the first time. They kind of understood that. When you were 17? Uh, I was 19 when I first started performing. Okay. Yeah. And they saw it and they understood it and they just wanted me to be happy at that point. They sort of lost their tiger parenting after my sister's death and sort of realized 
it's the most important thing is for our children to be happy and for do sure. something they love to do. What were you doing from what? So you dropped out when you were eighteen, then I guess, because you were there yeah. for a year. Yeah. What were you trying to do in between? Did you tell them right away? Uh, no, I was just doing a lot of drugs. Yes. Uh, okay. A lot of drugs. <laughs> yeah. Taking mushrooms and acid by myself and crying. Well, you need the inspiration, right? Yeah. I well, mean, and moving through grief and like not yes. knowing how to reconcile like losing this person who I've seen every day my yep. entire life yep. um and i actually saw margaret cho perform for the first time and because she looked like me i was like oh i guess i could do that and mm. i've always wanted to act i was the little red hen and when i was five in the school play maybe i'm a star <laughs> so just started pursuing it <laughs> and that was like you're one of the first times you've seen someone that's looked similar to you on, on screen, you're saying? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, before we had, like, what? We had uh, Jackie Chan. Right. Bruce Which Lee. is a man, another man. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah, That's I pretty much it. Lou sometimes, but... True. Yeah. True. Yeah, it's uh, it, it was hard for me because I imagine... I'm, su I'm actually surprised they were so supportive because when I dropped out... I dropped out of my last year, actually, mm -hmm. so I was, like, 20, 21, and I didn't tell them for six months. Oh, my God. Yeah, and I booked a one-way ticket to Argentina mm -hmm. just so that, you know. Why did you drop out? You were a year away. I had like more of an, like a Asian reason, I guess, which is like I was starting a new company, and then mm -hmm. we got investors involved. Um, but that didn't work out. So like three months later, the company, the first company failed, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to go back. So it took me like six months to finally like wow. tell, tell my mom. Like I don't really talk to my dad too much, but – um, yeah, it took me like six months to tell my, tell my mom. Do they, ex do they explode? Like, do they well, she came to visit me in Argentina, in, uh -huh. in Buenos Aires, and it's like pretty, pretty sketchy there. So yeah. that's like when I decided to tell her in public. And then... <laughs> she can't make it, that's so mean. <laughs> what, what's she going to do? <laughs> I got to go home, mom. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'll follow you. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, she, she understood because I, I told her like I had a plan and all that stuff. But yeah, it was hard. Yeah. It was really hard. Were you going to school for something that you actually wanted to go to school for? No. Oh, okay. I was studying like economics and finance oh, and yeah. I was just like, no, I'm just not a numbers guy. I'm similar to you where like I'm, I'm pretty both um, left and right brain. Mm -hmm. And I feel about me though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so you, you decided to pursue stand up. Yes. And um, I know that wasn't like exactly the easiest thing when you first started, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I had a blast. Uh, I was terrible when I first started. I think my first joke was something about like seeing a dick for the first time is like seeing Godzilla or some <laughs> dumb, dumb racist shit. And uh, but the better I got, actually, the worse my anxiety around it got. And yes. I, I had to go to a lot of therapy to figure out it was like self sabotage, and I didn't believe I deserved to be happy and all this stuff. Um, but I actually. I loved it. It was like the only way I felt alive was being mm. on stage after my sister died. And wow. getting people to laugh at something was so cathartic. Yeah. yeah. You, t you talk about the, the story of how, uh, this is going back to Margaret Show, which is when this all happened, when, you're, when, you're, when your sister passed away, um, you didn't laugh for like a couple of months. Years, yeah. For years? I didn't laugh for years until I saw Margaret perform. Oh yeah. my God. And the first time you, I guess you, you laughed mm -hmm. when you saw her, that was like a revelation for you. This is like a way for you to escape, yeah. almost you would say. Yeah, for like half an hour. Because when someone you love that much dies, it's all you can think about, you know, whether you want to or not. It yeah. was always at the forefront of my mind. And seeing Margaret perform, she was so funny. Um, she had this phenomenal joke uh, about like a school shooting that I, I, I don't want to butcher it, but it was so well done. And basically like yeah. praised Asians because at the time, like the, the school shooter with the most kills was an Asian man. And <laughs> so it was like one of those. And I was like, it was crying. Korean, Korean person. Yeah, too, right? <laughs> it was Korean. And I was just like, oh my God, like it was so <laughs> shocking that she could be that edgy but also funny and give everyone permission to laugh over something so fucking dark yeah um and so for like a beautiful 30 minutes i finally forgot my sister was dead or i like didn't think about it in that 30 minutes and uh wanted to give that to somebody else i was like oh comedy is a beautiful way to let people escape from like the tragedy of their own lives and get out of their own heads and just mm. give them some reprieve yeah and it obviously it helped you to i guess openly talk about it but not in such a serious way yeah. it allows you to Joke around it a little bit. Yeah. 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 Um, I think the joke that Margaret showed it wasn't it something around like when white people kill you, it's like you, they use knives or something like that. Whereas 
when Asians kill, they just they go all in or something <laughs> like that. It was not, probably something like that. I think she was like the one I'm thinking of is uh, about how Asians are like always excelling at everything they do, and she's like, look at the Virginia Tech shooter. Like, <laughs> oh god, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, by the way, this this is to go to go back to um to the point about my aunt who lived there in Okinawa. Mm -hmm. Um, she actually also committed suicide when she, suicide. when I was 15 and she was like my mom's best friend. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the age difference between four years, four years. So yeah. my, my mom and my, uh, my aunt was three years. Uh -huh. Um, so yeah, when I heard that story that, that you went through, I was like, damn, yeah, this is, this is, um, cause you know, like the Korean culture, we don't really talk about it so much. So yeah. I was never also, cause it's like my mom, I was never really there for her in terms of being able to know exactly what she's going through i was like 15 at that time um but yeah it was it was like a really really tough time so i imagine that um it was like losing your best friend in, in oh, many yeah. ways and i feel like it's harder in well asian americans specifically are like three times less likely to seek any kind of mental health resource compared to like any other uh, demographic, as well yeah. as Asian American women are the second highest demographic to kill themselves. So I feel like there's this insane stigma in the Asian community where we don't talk about mental health. We don't want to talk about mental health. It's taboo to take medicine. If you yeah. go to a therapist, which the older generation calls a shrink, which has all this, this its own negative stigma. Uh, it's like, no wonder we're losing yeah. people left and right to suicide. We're unwilling to give them the space to feel comfortable to express their sadness. And it's like, life has so much sadness we should yeah. have a support system in place and i remember when i got very into the science behind suicide the people less likely to commit suicide are latin families because they're so mm. socially integrated that's so true there's such that's like so i mean they don't get any privacy but there's yeah. so much presence and yeah. like meddling and almost insertion into people's lives in latin families you know generally speaking yes. that they are the least likely to commit suicide because their social bonds are so strong and so securely attached whereas right. i grew up in a household where everybody grabs your rice bowl and you go into your room and go and on your computer it. and play, play a game. starcraft yeah yes. uh, there was no talk of of hey i'm feeling sad about this there, we didn't even talk about my sister's death when it happened or why it happened or did she have bipolar disorder was this just a rash decision made by someone who was going through puberty and had a lot of hormones going through their body um and to this day my parents still don't really believe in clinical depression like when yeah. i went on antidepressants they gave me a bag of niacin and vitamins and they were wow. like depression goes away as you get older you just got to take your vitamins and i was like that's not how it works you guys um but there's just it's just a generational gap Wow, but you, you, I imagine you did a lot of research just after this, yeah. um, going through it. I did something similar as well, which was the biggest thing that I found was that, uh, and, and Dennis Rodman was our first episode, he talks about this as well, because he was trying to commit suicide as well, which is the people that are the most dangerous or the most likely are the ones that are less likely to talk about it because they don't need that external validation or, or help. Mm -hmm. They know that's what they're going to do, whereas the people that... Um, or actually seeking help are the ones that give you these like subtle hints yeah. here and there. Um, and that was the same case for my aunt. Like she, no one knew, yeah. no one knew. And I imagine yeah. it was the same for your little sister. Yeah. Yeah. No one saw that coming. Wow. Yeah. Um, anyways, <laughs> <laughs> bring in the mood down. <laughs> I actually wanted to talk about this first, just so that we can, <laughs> just so that we can go through this. Yeah. Um, so then you decided to pursue, comedy um and then how did you discover youtube all of a sudden um well i was doing stand-up for like two or three years pretty consistently and my brother is someone who like loved niga higa community channel happy slip like all the og creators on youtube who were huge were asian american because we didn't have representation anywhere very else true, very true um and so i started watching and i was like oh this is great because when you first start out stand-up you know you're at a coffee shop and people don't want to listen to you or a laundromat and people are trying not to make eye contact with you and you're constantly trying to get people's attention and make them laugh yeah. at, op at open mics or just weird locations. And so I loved the idea that someone could voluntarily click on a video I made and want to watch it instead mm. of me being an annoying person in a public space. <laughs> so I started doing YouTube for that reason and it's sort of what took off for me just also because we had no representation, I think, in the comedy space as much for, sure. for me as an Asian American. American woman um yeah and it's been it's been a blast I've been doing it for like 12 years 
So then how old are you when you first started making YouTube videos? I think I was like 20, 21. 21. Yeah. And then was it always, because I know a lot of the things that you talk about are very relatable. Yeah. Um, sometimes dark, but it's, it's stuff that's real life. Mm -hmm. But you put a spin on making it really funny. Mm -hmm. Was it always been that from the beginning? No, no. I had like weird sketch shows. Like I did, what? I tried, <laughs> like it was called 10 Second Traumas. It okay. was like basically like Vine, but I would we would try to make like 10 second skits um, that were just very dumb. And then, I don't know, I did all these weird vlogs because people, when you start, you don't really know what your voice is or what you want to talk about or what you gravitate to. So For sure. they're like, here's me at the grocery store. And I was like, I can't vlog. Like, I'm <laughs> very uninteresting in real life. Um, yeah. And then just kind of landed on my form at, which was I loved community channel and I loved Ryan Higa and I was like that's what I want to do I want to do something scripted mm. something thought out something planned but concise sort of like a thesis paper because I loved writing papers in college um, so that's sort of what became my medium and it's just sort of gravitated towards mental health and comedy right just because it's it's so uh, a lot of it is just sharing your own experiences and your and your own stories yeah um, and I like the way you take it which is like you don't take the you don't take the approach where like you're the coach mm -hmm. and you're trying to give advice to people. This is more like this is what I'm going. This is what I learned from other experts that are out in the field mm -hmm. or you admit some of the mistakes that you've had. So it's a really refreshing way to, I think, learn from someone like yourself yeah. in that sense. Um, and I know a lot of the people that you've developed, they are they're so attached to you because of that, right? Yeah. They can relate to you in, in so, many, so many different ways. I think so. A lot of people call me the free therapist of the internet because all, all of the advice I put out there is something given to me by a licensed therapist that I've then put mm. into practice in my own life. So I'm not just like dispersing my own advice. Yeah. I'm like, no, this is something I went through and also with the help of a qualified professional and therefore maybe somebody can benefit from it. Right. Yeah. You still see a therapist uh, oh, yeah. on, on a regular basis? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I've always thought about it, but people that... Um, I don't know, like, I, I've been through, I haven't been through, like, super traumatic things. You at least. have to be through super traumatic things. But that's what I mean. Things. Apparently, like, you learn so much yeah. just going through it. Um, what have been some of the things you've, you've kind of uncovered from, like, a general perspective? Well, my current therapist is my favorite of all time. I love her. I see her once a week. But there's a lot of stuff I've been dealing with in my career lately where as the more successful I get, the more I have imposter syndrome or I have a lot of social anxiety or, you know, I become convinced everyone who loves me actually secretly hates me on the inside and I don't know how to undo these like, things. Like friends or people friends, that... Friends, okay. family. I'm like, do they all actually hate me? Um, or I'm in weird business situations where boundaries are crossed if I'm working with friends or working with family and I'm like how do I balance you know being someone's boss but also being a good friend to them yeah so my therapist helps me just sort of navigate things validates me where she feels like I should be validated but then also gives me like practical tips to use in my real life and in, in my specific situation yeah which is why I think everyone should go for sure yeah. for sure what do you mean imposter syndrome Imposter syndrome, I'm feeling like I don't belong, feeling like, oh, this success was just an accident, has nothing to do with my hard work or talent. It's all just luck and the cosmos of the universe or feeling like you're in a situation like I was just on a huge, huge set, um, just multi-million dollar set. And I, I felt like I was the only person who didn't belong and who didn't mm. deserve to be there and also have hang ups about, oh, I'm the digital person. I'm only here because like YouTube and everyone in the acting world kind of hates YouTube and the traditional world looks down on YouTube. So I get a lot of people who come up to me and don't believe I'm a real actor or don't treat me like I'm a real actor. And so I have a lot of anxiety around whether or not I belong in a space like that. Whoa. Damn. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I do feel it also as well, just when I'm interviewing different people, it's I, I don't want to come off as the kind of guy that is giving also the different types of advice that may not be super applicable for most people. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of creators tend to feel that way for mm -hmm. sure. Um, so how, how have you gotten past that? Well, it's therapy. ongoing. I don't think it ever ends. Okay, so but. therapy wasn't like this <laughs> yeah. revelation. No, I think you <laughs> okay. just, it, the work is annoying because as soon as you like, fix one issue or like feel like you have a good handle on it your therapist will like peel back the layer and you're like oh there's all this other stuff oh, oh damn it god like, oh. damn it yeah well never... four more years of therapy yeah. because of that <laughs> <laughs> 50 more years of therapy and i'll be fine <laughs> yeah. uh, but despite you know the the fact that I mean, you're still pursuing it at, at a very high level mm -hmm. you're, you're doing acting you're doing comedy uh, and now you're doing a lot of music yeah, yeah, as your yeah. big focus. Mm -hmm. And what's been the transition there? What's the reason behind that? Um, comedy, as much as I loved it, I, I did it for 12 years. I was doing stand-up 
I did tours. It was incredibly lonely. And I stopped finding things funny. Like mm. at a certain point, I mean, I'm 30 now. And I was like, I have no desire to escape now. I feel like on a societal level, we're all like not looking to escape anymore. We escaped and now we have Donald Trump. So I want to be a lot more present. I want to be a lot more mindful. Right. Impeached. I, but <laughs> <laughs> Get out of there. Get out. But, yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think just with this age, I also loved the way that, you know, comedy tries to take you away from your issues for a little bit. Music t tells you to sit with your issues for a little bit and work through them. Yes. And I loved that differentiation. And it just felt like a natural uh, evolution for me as a comedian because I used to play guitar and do stand up comedy songs in my act. Right. And so now I was like, oh, I'd, I'd rather like make serious music and talk about these issues in a more sincere way instead of making people laugh about it. And it's a different medium, right? So you can yeah. still talk about, you can still get the same message out there, but you have a different creative outlet yes. to, to do it. And it obviously keeps your creative juices flowing. 100%. Um, have you read the book by Scott Adams called How to Fail at Everything and Still Win Big? No. It's a really good book. I totally butchered it when when Timothy Delegato came here. I'm like how to win big but fail at <laughs> anything. Yeah. And he's like, what? <laughs> he's like, I don't want to read that book. Yeah, so I like researched the book title, yeah. practiced it in the washroom. Um, but the book talks about how you can be. There's two ways to be like extraordinary at your career or anything that you do, which is become the top one percent at one single thing. So you've got the LeBron James of the world, you've got the Warren Buffetts of the world, or particularly this is where um, a lot of people are doing now, which is you become the top 25% at two or three things and you combine them where there's very few people can do all three things that mm. you can do at that level. Yeah, Could be temp top 10%, obviously, the yeah. more the better. Yeah. Um, looking at your career, it seems like whether that was intentional or whether that was accidental, seems like that's kind of the pathway that you've uh, molded yourself into. Oh, well, thank you. That's very flattering. Um, I just like a lot of things. And I feel like the previous generation always honed in on get good at one thing, get good at one thing. But we're living longer now. Who wants to only do one thing and be defined by one thing for the rest of your life? That's boring. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I very much follow my artistic impulses wherever they lead me. And I feel like everything you do can only serve what you absolutely love to do and like drive your art further and drive you as a human being further. Yeah. So I definitely try to focus on a wide variety of things that I'm passionate about at the time. I think part of it is because I know you've done a lot traveling also when you were young. Mm -hmm. Do you think that has to do with it as well? Like you've traveled so much. This is the way I think about it, which is I've traveled um, every few years. I would live in a different country or different city. And in my 20s, I did that mm -hmm. like on steroids. Every three months, I would live in a different country. And there was this excitement where every time I would move to a different country, I would grow as like a person. Mm -hmm. So from Korea to Canada, let's say my life completely changed. Uh, and then from Vancouver to Montreal was like a different experience. And there was like this addiction of wanting to have these different experiences where you associate traveling or moving or mm -hmm. doing something new with personal growth. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever get that as well? Because I know you traveled a lot when you were young. Yeah, I think exposing yourself to different cultures kind of simultaneously expands you, but makes you realize everybody's kind of the same. Human beings are the same across the world. They just have completely different ways of going about it. Um, yeah. Why'd you do that every three months So your 20s? Uh, well, visa issues, first of all, because there's like 98 rules in, in uh -huh. Buenos Aires or, or Colombia. Um, but also, I just had this thing where I would go from Argentina to Colombia and then make myself up to New York, uh -huh. which is where I was staying. Um, and I didn't want to... Well, I, sometimes I ended up staying a little bit longer, but... Um, the, the problem with that is like you, you start to associate like doing something new with, with growth. So uh -huh. there's this like positive association with it. And I think that can, I don't know, for me at least that can sometimes transfer over to like relationships. Mm. Oh, so you're a commitment phobe. Not a commitment phobe. Uh, I don't mean like, like, uh, love relationships. I mean more like just in general where I, you get into this habit where you meet someone new and you already know that you're leaving. Mm -hmm. So you get really good mm -hmm. at the first week or, or month. Mm -hmm. And you become the kind of person that like everyone wants to be around because you're very extroverted. And then you just leave. So 
at a certain point, it's just like you just get exhausted, uh-huh. and it's part of the reason why like I'm spending more time in LA. But um, yeah, I don't know. This there's there's like this association that a lot of my friends that travel a lot has has this as well. So I was wondering if that's something that you went through since you travel a lot when you were I in childhood. Mean, I definitely think new experiences do equal growth. I think it becomes a problem when you are unable to maintain relationships over time. Like I've had a hard time maintaining relationships more than two years because I'm used to, oh, two years, bye. I become a whole new person now in this next country. I get to decide which part of my personality I want to exaggerate. Blank slate, yeah. Which is why I've become an actor, I think. But (laughs) I don't know. I think that's it's it's really interesting. It depends on one person's relationship to traveling and what that growth means. I love travel. I feel like seeing new places, seeing history is such a rare thing in LA. Like the art oldest building is what a hundred years old it's nothing yeah it's nothing so i I love to go see things and know like oh humans did this how long have we been around where are we going um that kind of idea but i don't know yeah i guess travel can only help you to become a more well-rounded person right yeah right what was it like when you went from asia to to america um was there a lot of racism that you had to deal with well Predominantly, I grew up in the South, so I spoke with a North Carolina accent for no much way. of my childhood. And then I went immediately to Japan, where I was the majority, and then to Hawaii, where Asians are also the majority. And then I came to California when I was 16 mm. and encountered racism for the first time. But it was very odd to me because I'd never had it before. Yeah. Like, I didn't even realize I was Asian until I went to Japan. And I was like, oh, white people are <laughs> what I just came from. Yeah. Um, yeah, on my first day of high school, this guy was like, "Go back to China, you chink." And I was just like, "I'm Japanese." I'm Japanese. Yeah, like oh, thank I, you. Yeah. yeah. He like spit and I was like, "Oh, okay." All right. He spat? He like spat yeah, at my feet and I was so dumbfounded. What the fuck? I just thought it was funny cuz I was like, <laughs> "So you weren't offended idiot? at all." I'm Japanese. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, "Jokes you on tell. you." Yeah. You <laughs> stupid bitch. Uh, sorry, I hope I can swear. It's okay. Um, you can definitely swear. <laughs> yeah. And then I discovered I really discovered racism when it came to, you know, being in the industry. Um, well, oh, also yeah. cuz like in high school I tried out to be Anne Frank for like the at my theater. No way. Yeah. And they were like, "What are you doing? You can't do this." I was like, "Why not? I'm an actor." <laughs> they were like, you're literally a part of the axis of power. It's like, you are the person who persecuted Anne Frank. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I guess oh, that yeah. makes sense. Um, but the industry has made me realize uh, how prevalent racism is in America and uh, made me a much stronger advocate for it. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Did you deal with that when you were in high school a lot then? Yeah, yeah. White people were very weird. My school was also segregated by race. So everyone only hung out with their race, which was Uh, very weird. That was similar to my high school, too. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like sometimes I do see that in L.A. a little bit as well. Yeah. It's still happening a little bit, right? Yeah. I don't don't know. I was also a group hopper, so I had, like, different friend groups. But it was interesting to me my first day of high school there. All the Asians descended upon me and were like, hello, you're part of our group now. And I was like, oh, am I? Okay. <laughs> What's the initiation? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you hung out with a lot of Asians when you were in high school, you're yeah, saying? Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, similar to me. Um, and then, so now you're in the industry, which is like, this is a real thing. It's yeah. not just plays and games anymore. This yeah. is stuff that's going to affect your livelihood. Um, what's What's been something that you've dealt with? Um, have you, are you still dealing with it right now, I guess, in your recent career? In my what? Are you still dealing with a lot of... With racism? Not racism, but just being misrepresented given I, that you're going yeah. into music and film. It's better now, I think. Uh, being an Asian American has uh, never been a better time in the industry because we're now finally starting to give voice with things like Crazy Rich Asians and Fresh Off the Boat and The Farewell. Um, there are a lot more opportunities for Asian Americans to not just be... I'm the funny sidekick or I'm the girl who's sad that I got to be or like, yeah. all the auditions I went on in my earlier years were, you know, sad student. Um, oh my God. She's so nerdy. Uh, she gives a happy ending after this massage. <laughs> oh Just like awful, awful stuff. Um, and now it's like, oh, I'm going out for a role in which my race has literally nothing to do with the role at all. Yeah. 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 I mean, I feel like um, Asian Asian women have been at least getting some some spotlight. It's mm-hmm. never been represented correctly, mm-hmm. for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but does it help that you are, I guess, like part Asian 
at all or does it not affect it at all do they just see you they as just like the, see me as asian so i'm not white person. passing but um i don't know i've the most interesting thing i've i've encountered in the industry is that asian men and asian women are treated the opposite like asian yes. women are highly sexualized and fetishized asian men are emasculated completely yeah. and it, it's been interesting to finally have people like john cho who got to be the lead in selfie or camille nanjiani i don't know if you saw i posted all these like sexy buff half naked pics because he's going to be in the next marvel movie oh really I yeah okay. people are like losing their mind he was like on the front page of Pornhub. <laughs> <laughs> it was great i was like yeah sexualized that asian <laughs> oh, man get it get it um so it's been weird like i've also noticed in the community just like, have you heard of the rice pill? The rice pill? It's like the red pill, but for Asians. Uh, is this like when you get drunk, you don't want to go red, so you take the pill? <laughs> no, no. No? The red, do you know what incels are? Yes. Okay, so the red pill is a part of Reddit full of incels who believe like rape should be legalized, da 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 The rice pill is an Asian subsect of Asian men who believe that Asian women should only be with Asian men. And oh, like, that is so funny. Yeah, they take it upon themselves to just hate on Asian women in the entertainment industry across the board. Wow. So like this weird thing of dealing with people of your own race thinking you're like a traitor to your race or that you owe your race something has been an interesting part of the industry as well. Like Constance Wu came under attack from them. I've been under attack from them. Yeah. Been a very uh, hostile group. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, I can't, I can't, um, I can't imagine how, how difficult it is. I mean, it's, there's the, the also, there's a pressure for Asian women now to date Asian men because they're speaking out so people feel like oh they're they're like hypocrites if they don't date Asian mm -hmm. men mm -hmm. um it's it's hard for me to relate like I grew up in Canada but I've I haven't really dated a lot of Asian women either so I never really understood that yeah and if an Asian wo a man is seen with a white woman everyone's always like yeah they cheer for them yeah. <laughs> all the time whether it's Latina or, yeah. or or white woman um is there pressure on you in that sense to like speak for the Asian woman? Are you because you you're really one of the faces in the, in the younger generations for for Asian women? Um, yeah. I mean, I can't represent them all. Yeah, you, know, you know how it is when you're the token Asian in the group, and every white person looks at you to see if it's okay. But yeah. um, I don't know. I think it is such an interesting thing because America's a melting pot. So it's like I don't. You know, dating is hard enough. Why am I going to limit myself to one pool of mediocrity? No offense to everyone here. But, you know, dating men is, taken. is its own thing. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, oh, I feel like I offended you all. I'm so sorry. Out. Okay. Yeah, we're going to wrap it up pretty soon. Yeah, or, okay. we'll cut it out. <laughs> I've just all the men. Um, yeah, no, no. No, joke, joke. Um, no, I don't know. I don't know, man. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough all around. Dating. <laughs> no, I've always been attracted to women, but I've only like really been emotionally into a handful in my life. So I skew more male. Um, but I, I felt like it was important to come out about it because people have this idea that bisexuality has to be 50-50 down the middle. And I was right. like, that's not what it is. But it's not, yeah. yeah. Um, and so you've had that for a while. You've had that since you were, since you were yeah. a child. Yeah. And then you came out fairly recently, I yeah, think? Yeah, uh, I had a lot of internalized... Uh, uh, homophobia to work through in my 20s oh man yeah. um but i guess the positive thing is that uh, i think you made a video around this which is you understand men oh, a yeah. lot more and yeah. you can empathize with what men go through yeah um what are some of those things that that you mentioned so people I mean, like the first time i got used by a woman for free dinner i was just like what? They do that? And all my guy friends were like, yeah, you idiot. Yeah. Like, of course <laughs> they do it. And I was like, oh, that feels like so gross and makes me sad. Or, um, well, how, how did that happen? She just invited you out. She asked me out. She asked you out. Chose the place, ordered a lot of things. Is it like an expensive place too? It was too? an expensive place. Didn't Damn. want a second date. It was very, like afterwards, I definitely felt like, Oh, oh yeah, no, that was a hundred percent just to get a free meal. Well, um, so that was I had a lot of sympathy then, as well as um, the first time I had sexual intercourse with a woman, I felt like this immense pressure to perform, of like, oh, I gotta do well. Uh, what if I like, oh man, like I gotta make feel good. And so I was like, oh, I've I've never had that kind of pressure before as a woman. You just lay down, and you're like, here we go, let's have a good time. Um, Are you saying you felt more of the 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 male like? masculine character like, in like, that yeah, kind like of relationship i had to please this other person yeah. yeah and i had to perform well and like 
make sure she felt really good, which, you know, obviously I have felt that in heterosexual relationships, but it's less of a pressure, I think, because, I mean, I'm sorry to be crude, but like you're just getting fucked when you're with a dude, you know, with a woman, you're like fucking her. And so, Depends what yeah. kind of sex you have. Yeah. <laughs> So there's some kinky Asian yeah. sex out there. Yeah. <laughs> some furries. We're gonna watch cats tonight. Um, but yeah, I, I I can imagine. So, um, what's and, and are you mostly dating male then, or how does that? How do yeah, you transition? Yeah, I'm mostly that? dating men. I've dated some women here and there, but it's just a different ball game with women. And I feel like I'm very behind. I feel like very much like a baby queer. And so I'm also very intimidated by very beautiful women. Cause I'm like, mm. how do I know if she's gay or likes women? Like, how do, do you know? Step? I don't know. I asked Twitter and everyone was like, look at the, the length of her nails. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, but that doesn't mean anything. I have long nails. Does that, does that go for gay guys too then? I, my no. nails yesterday. No. The eyes, like eyes. long eye contact, yeah, or yeah, that's part of it for sure. Oh, I don't know. There's just something there. I can't describe it. Oh, that's my gaydar. Right? Ooh, I also have really bad gaydar. I didn't oh. even detect it in myself for like 25 years. So. Have you ever approached someone and they're like, "No, I'm not. I'm not gay." I don't ask them outright. I've I've kind of like been like, oh, do you know King Princess or like Kaylee Kyoko? Like some I, name name drop queer musicians. Other, other, yes, to yes. See if they know of them, and yeah, that gives me a good idea. And based on the reaction, I guess yeah. you would know. Yeah. Interesting. There's some tricks here, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So what's what's kind of this next thing that you're most excited about these days? Uh, Netflix's Jupiter's Legacy is something I just wrapped. Mm -hmm. uh, very excited. For that one, it's a superhero period epic written by Mark Millar. It's based on his comic book. He did Kingsman, Kick-Ass, a bunch of great properties. So Netflix bought that outright and just produced eight episodes. Uh, I get to play a, a ninja with superpowers. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. So very excited. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, Asian representation, I guess, in, in some senses that way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so you're, you're still doing music. You're mm -hmm. still doing acting. Um but you have this amazing discipline. So I want to dig deeper into in terms of how you manage your time a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big fan of Google Calendar. Um, I yes. love keeping track of my time. I keep everything color coordinated. I'm also someone who loves on Sunday to plan out my week slash review my last week to see if I'm happy with how I spent my time. Um, I have all of those notifications on my phone that will let me know, you've spent an hour on Instagram today. So I could be like, oh my God. You have the time remaining thing? Yeah, yeah I do too. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I don't know. I'm quite good at, I think, attention management more so than time management. Like if I have a task, that I, I know I can get it done in a reasonable amount of time and I won't be distracted while I get it done. I love the way you have your hands like this also. <laughs> as soon as you started talking about productivity, <laughs> it's just, just like, well, well let me it's tell a you color coordinated Google at, calendar. <laughs> at 0035. <laughs> Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much for making the time to come yeah. on. Um, we, I usually end it off by giving people actual advice, but I actually want to change it up a little bit, which is yeah. what's something that you're grateful for today? Oh my God. Um, I'm going to go see cats and I'm really grateful that I have an amazing support system of women who I get to date all the time as my friends. Like it's just, it's made being single so much fun and so much more bearable and also being a human being and, and being a workaholic much more manageable by having great friends. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, guys, well check out Anna. Where can everyone find you online? Just Anna Connor. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. All right. Sorry, that went off the rails a little bit. It did. Uh, a couple it did. times. I was just like, oh, this is where the conversation has led us. I, I, I don't know how to get the set for that interview.